Hey folks, John here from A's for Alcoholic again. Today's conversation is with K.L. Wells. She is the founder of Voices in Courage. It is a website, community, resource center for those people dealing with us alcoholics and addicts, especially the ones in active addiction. Um, it was a great reminder that there are more of them than there are of us. And she was full of all kinds of insights into how to deal with us, especially when you have a loved one who's who's drinking, who's using all the time, and how you not only have to deal with them, but live your own life as well. And she's the second non-alcoholic we've had on the show. And um, it was really good. It was really, really good. And it's a, it's a good reminder to me uh, that there are other people who have to deal with our shit and that we should remember them and do our best to be kind at all times. So yeah, without further ado, here is my conversation with K.L. Wells. K.L. Wells, thank you so much for doing this. Um, you are, I'm, I'm going to make an assumption here, you are the second non-alcoholic that I've had on the show. Fantastic. Um, <clears throat> you know, I... The feedback I get is mostly from alcoholics, recovering addicts, uh, mm -hmm. and there was uh, one woman, Chelsea Piquise is her name, and she does a podcast where she talks to addicts and stuff because her father was an mm -hmm. alcoholic and died um, far too early, and so it was a lot of her trying to understand mm -hmm. why, why did my dad do this when yeah. he seemingly knew better, and we all knew better. Mm -hmm. Um and, you know, whenever I talk to people, one of the things I like to get, and I know your story is going to be a little bit different, is I'm always interested in if they grew up in an alcoholic family, mm -hmm. if this was, so did, what's your earliest memory of alcohol or alcohol abuse in your family or in your own life? Was it well, it wasn't so much alcohol in my family. It was um, prescription medications. Uh -huh. um, my mom was addicted to prescription medications. You know, back in the 50s and 60s, that's what they did. And um, so I grew up with a mom who was addicted, but I didn't know that until I was probably somewhere around 19 or 20 uh, when my dad, you know, kind of told us one day. Mm -hmm. Um. And in the midst of that, my brother, um, who had gotten a kidney disease when he was really little, he started using drugs. <clears throat> he was probably 12 or 13 um, while I was still at home because we were only 11 months apart. So I had my mom and I had my brother. And then years later, I married an alcoholic um, who was a Vietnam vet suffering from, from post-traumatic stress. And navigated that for about five years and, and said, I, I can't keep doing this. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, lo and behold, I have a son who is 30, um, who has struggled with substance abuse <clears throat> since he was a teenager. Um, there was yeah. a break in there, um, <clears throat> but certainly pretty heavy since probably 19. Yeah, I... I had a, an opportunity to interview my mother for the show. And, oh, that's so um, great. And so that was very insightful because mm -hmm. even though a lot of the time that I had spent drinking, we were either living apart or in other states and stuff like that, mm -hmm. it was extremely easy for me as an active alcoholic to... Um, to completely ignore, forget, and not see mm -hmm. the damage I was doing to people in my life, mm -hmm. right? The mm -hmm. damage I was doing to my own mother mm -hmm. um, just by the fact that I was, I just didn't care. And, you know, mm -hmm. I'm sure you know this, that the, the, the alcohol just takes over and it's not mm -hmm. me because I mm -hmm. knew very well how to be kind and sweet and loving to my mother, especially when I needed money. Right. Right. Especially when yes. I needed a check. <laughs> know that so well. <laughs> um, but and she's not an alcoholic either. I mean, we, we would go out and she would maybe have a couple of cocktails and like, ooh, I'm a little flushed and I'm done and I'm ready for bed, mm -hmm. you know, or a couple glasses mm -hmm. of wine at Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And so 
my father definitely was, but um, it was just always interesting to me and eye opening that there's people, there's other people that get affected. Yes. And I think that's just part of the disease. Mm -hmm. So I think about Sam as Sam, the person that I know from a heart centered place who he really is. And then I think about the addict and they're two completely different people. Right. Um, and, and, and still as clear as it is in my head, I still have these moments. Um, like my son's has, is in relapse right now. And, um, and called or texted messaged, you know, a few days ago, you know, wanting money and, and the stories and all the things that completely pull out a mother's heartstrings, you know, uh, my son is living in his car and he doesn't have, have food and, you know, all of the things. And I know he doesn't know as the addict what's going on from that perspective, because it's all about survival at that point. And survival is getting the next hit. Yeah. And so, however, I've seen him clean and sober enough um, to see the real Sam, you know, for bits and pieces of time. And, um, and I think there's just so much shame and guilt and stigma and judgment around this that he hasn't really even begun to deal with. Um, and, but I do think that that's part of the equation in him carrying this with him right now um, in understanding that there are some, that this is hard on me. Yeah. Um, but I don't, I mean, I don't know how you would be able to step into that recognition in the midst of using um, because you're so focused on getting your fix. Yeah. I mean, I think there's glimpses of it, right? But Mm -hmm. the, the immediately with those glimpses comes the the shame and the guilt that you're talking about and I go I really need to get rid of that shame and that guilt and the only tool I have for to getting rid of that shame and guilt is to use again is to drink right. again right. and so and then that goes again and on and on and on and on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um but yeah you know when I think about my relationship with my own mother now mm -hmm. and I mean I'm six years sober, mm -hmm. uh, it's light years ahead of what it was and the conversations I was able to have and, mm -hmm. and how absolutely distant mm -hmm. and disinterested I was. And it's not as an addict, right. As a, as an alcoholic, yes. very clear um, about that as an alcoholic, as an active alcoholic, those were the things I was like, yeah, I don't have time for this. Mm -hmm. I got, I got stuff to do. Right. And, um, <clears throat> so when I think about what you are doing and how um, working toward helping people to support themselves, yes. regardless, right? Regardless of what their, their addicted or, you know, alcoholic loved ones are going to do. Mm -hmm. It's, it's ultimately, I mean, I don't want to just say it's a choice because that it, that's, that's, that doesn't seem fair because mm -hmm. it really is like something that grabs hold. And I've had moments where I'm like, I can't help myself. And I just go and do it. And I watch mm -hmm. myself do it. Mm -hmm. um, but you're going to have to allow people to live their lives, regardless mm -hmm. of whether or not it's good for them. Right? It's a really different thing to deal with a, a child who's still at home mm -hmm. versus an adult. And, you know, at this point, my son is 30 years old. And so you know, he has to make the decision that um, he wants to get his life back again. Now, you know, he's been in and out of rehabs and relapsed multiple times. And the way that I frame it is um, every rehab, every relapse is one more step towards the time when um, he will be able to put these things together for a, a longer period of time, more than a year, you know, two, right. three, four, five years. Um, but I can see the trajectory of how this takes place. It's almost like this wave that just mm -hmm. kind of, it, it's a slow moving wave that kind of dips down and relapse and then he'll come back up again. But every rise is a mm -hmm. higher rise. Mm -hmm. And um, it's unfortunate that um, the lows are lower each time. So the rise 
up out of it is harder, I think. Um, but I won't really know until he's on the other side and really much clearer in his thinking um, to, to be able to check in with him. But to kind of speak to what you were talking about is, you know, I saw him in September and he was, he was clean and sober and he was happy and we have a, a wonderful relationship. Um, and now he's the addict again. And um, just holding the space and loving him through his journey and his own unfolding. It, wow, that's such a big lift. And, um, and I am committed to that. And, and it's one of the reasons why we birthed Voices and Courage was because I didn't want to stay in the crisis. I didn't want to stay in the struggling. I didn't want to stay in the surviving. I actually wanted to thrive in the midst of dealing with his addiction because I love my life. Right. And I have a great marriage now and I have a great business and I have great friends and, you know, and I just have this one part of my life um, that is, um, you know, really troubled and very tough to navigate. And I did not want it to become the bigger part of my life. Right. Can you tell me a little bit about the initial crisis that sparked this the idea for this, you know, you talked about, there was um, an issue with your son getting mm -hmm. arrested. Mm -hmm. So there's two things that really sparked this first was um, this was August of 2018. We had gone up, we live in Oregon. He lives in Washington. We had gone up because at that point we knew that he was wandering the streets um, and he was in drug psychosis. And he was enough in contact with us that we could tell that was what was going on. So we drove up to find him, which we did, um, feed him, and then hopefully help him get some sleep, not knowing actually what the plan was after that. Um, and so in the midst of that, we fed him, we had a hotel room, and his paranoia just took a hold of him, and he just you know, ran, ran out of the hotel. Um, so within an hour later, I heard the sirens and I looked out, we were up on the fourth floor. I looked out and saw him walking up the hill. And then I watched a cop car pull up right behind him, get out of his car and draw his gun. And so I went down the stairs as quick as I could to get on the street so that the police knew that there was somebody else present there right. uh, for him. And, um, and then held the space for him to be loved in one of the most traumatic moments of his life and my life. And, and then gave the information to the, one of the police officers that he was in drug psychosis and what was taking place. And, um, and I mean, obviously that was an extraordinarily traumatic experience for me to witness that um, because he didn't go peacefully. Um, it took four officers to load him in the, in the car and, um, and I completely fell apart once it was over with. And, and then you go about, then I was like, okay, we, we drive home. Uh, then we need to find out, okay, how do we navigate the jail system? How do we find out how he's doing? because he's in drug psychosis, you know? So they put mm -hmm. him in solitary and, mm -hmm. and, and, and it, you know, the story kind of goes on from there. And we figured out how to navigate it. I started calling people that I know, my tribe, my community. Um, I have great, wonderful friends that were able to connect us up with people who would know how to navigate this and so on and so forth. And so that was part of the, the journey then. And then about a year later, uh, my best friend is a practicing shaman. And um, I had had it on my list for quite a while to do a vision quest process, which is a nine month intensive process. And I was like, okay, I, I definitely need to do this now um, because I needed to find that higher version of myself and figure out a, 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 a higher way to navigate this where I wasn't lost in the midst of this disease. And so out of the vision quest process really came the inspiration for um, a community that was available to people that would give them 
training, group coaching, um, resources to books to read, videos to watch, um, a community to um, post questions in, get answers for, and um, and we've done a ton of interviews with all kinds of people at all different points in this disease and their journey along the way. Um, and I find the power of stories incredibly powerful um, in helping people navigate their own story and learning from other people. And so, so we've done a lot of interviews and we have those embedded in our membership yeah. also. And so that's those two twin pillars were really the impetus for Voices and Courage. And I would say is I have for decades lived into the question of anything that showed up that was traumatic, challenging, um, really tough. <clears throat> what are the gifts and lessons embedded in this experience for me? That is such, and, uh, it's such an important thing. And it's such a pain in my ass sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> even six years on. And I'm like, really, yeah. is this, the, so can we just not do this? Do I have to learn a lesson today? Yeah. <laughs> but ultimately uh, I find if I just go, well, okay, well, what is the lesson? Let's sit down and get your pen, get your paper, figure it out. Mm -hmm. It goes a lot smoother, right? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> and I mean, it's the other side of the coin of opportunity versus crisis. Yeah. And I'm a big believer from a spiritual place is that, you know, spirit is trying to get our attention for us to elevate back to our humanity. Mm -hmm. um, um, and what is, uh, can you, I just, I'm, just, before we go further, I, mm -hmm. I'm just curious, what is involved? Can you share a little bit about like what's involved in a vision quest at all? Sure. Or um, just from, you know, kind of have it, having it, um, think about it in terms of how it's put together is it's nine months. Um, there were three other questers that were involved in my vision mm -hmm. quest. Um, we are very tightly woven. Um, I was, I was the oldest. And then there was someone in their, in their forties and a couple in their late thirties. Um, we had two shamans that worked with us. Mm -hmm. And, um, so we came together every month on, for a full weekend to do a sweat lodge and be together. We had homework, um, you know, things that we needed to do, journaling that we needed to do, um, and time that we needed to spend out in nature and all those things. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the shamans was the, the mentor that I worked with once a month also. So those things were happening every single month um, to help us begin to gather tools and build a community that was extraordinarily powerful and supportive for each one of us. And for us to gather insights that, you know, you, we wouldn't normally gather because we don't create enough space for ourselves in this world to be still and quiet and peaceful so that we can actually hear um, our own spirit talking to us or spirit talking to us. Mm -hmm. And so, I, I would say that's, that's the main frame for it. And then okay. it's capstoned with four nights and, and five days in the wilderness solo. Wow. I mean, I think that the, yeah, for sure. The wilderness journaling, talking mm -hmm. with other people, mm -hmm. all of these things, especially, you know, clearing our heads, which are mm -hmm. so filled with so much. We've all got these, you know, devices in our pockets that want to fill our heads with all kinds of stuff mm -hmm. all the time. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, okay. No, that sounds, that sounds great. I'd it like to awesome. sign up for one of these. It was life changing. Um, <laughs> and um, up in the Oregon, uh, in the Oregon wilderness? Uh, we were actually up near Mount Rainier. Okay. Even more. Yeah, it's beautiful up there. Spectacular. Um, so voices encourage. Mm -hmm. that's this is the this is the program this is the website this is the community mm -hmm. that came from this among many other things mm -hmm. um and it is <clears throat> one of the things i heard you say in a previous podcast was that al-anon didn't give you what you were looking for mm -hmm. and you know i one of the jokes i've i've heard in alcoholics anonymous 
is that Alcoholics Anonymous is where we go to laugh and Al-Anon is where the, where our families go to cry, right? right. Like there's some, mm -hmm. there's some joke, maybe I'm messing mm -hmm. it up here, but, <laughs> and I remember in the very early days going to an Alano club and that I, someplace I'd never been to and trying and being really nervous and scared to go to this new place and go sit with strangers. And I've now learned that these people didn't care. They were there just to be helped and help each other. Mm -hmm. But I walked into a room <clears throat> And this woman gets up and she kind of walks toward me and she stops me and she says, I don't think this room is for you. This is Al-Anon. The Alcoholics Anonymous room is down the hall. Mm -hmm. And it's like she could see it on my face. Mm -hmm. She knew exactly wow. Wow. what wow. I was there for and that mm -hmm. it wasn't that. <laughs> and she was right. You know, yeah. she yeah. was absolutely right. And at first I was a little twinge of of defensiveness, like you don't know me. And it's like, she knew exactly who you were. She could see <laughs> right. it on your face. And yeah. um, so, so maybe Al-Anon didn't work for you. And, and, and what was it that, that, that failed or what were the, what were the holes you were looking to fill in with this program? Well, I'm a very proactive person by nature. And I wanted to learn how to lean into self-care. Mm -hmm. I wanted to learn how to build a community that would lift us up to thriving, not surviving. Um, I wanted to find out what are the beliefs and profound questions that we can lean into and ask ourselves that, again, will elevate us um, mm -hmm. in a thriving mindset. Um, and I wanted to find out, OK, what are the books? What are the videos? What are the podcasts? What are the th what are the resources right. that are available um, that have to do with my journey in this, um, not aimed towards fixing my son. Um, that was actually my side of the equation. And, you know, all, a, a lot of my friends are alcohol, uh, recovering alcoholics and addicts. And, you know, they, if they go to rehab, they have a tribe, they have a community, they walk away with mm. phone numbers, and then they get a sponsor, and then they, you know, go to these groups. And like you said, you know, you, you, you tell your stories, you laugh, but you're also elevated at the same time. Um, I didn't feel that at all in going to that particular group. And I realized that it's very, um, every group has its own mm, way of being. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just, it just wasn't, it wasn't elevated enough for me. Um, and I was very clear that I wanted to move into a thriving space. Okay. And that was not the conversations that were taking place whatsoever. Got um, it. it, it wasn't really even surviving. It was crisis right. conversations. And I was like, I yeah. cannot stay in this. Right. Because, you know, whatever you surround yourself with, you become. Mm -hmm. So I was really clear about that. And I was like, I'm not becoming more crisis. Right. Um, so. Yeah, I hear you. And I mean, I think that too, I've never been, I've never been one for any specific program of recovery for alcoholics. And obviously, you know, the same works for people who are dealing with, um, alcoholics and addicts in their lives. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's always been for me, whatever is going to work for you and help you. And there's also a whole nother set of, uh, of coping mechanisms, tools and tricks and all of that stuff that for people on your end, yes, <laughs> yes. that, that need. And, um, one of the things in the, and the voices of courage was you, uh, you talk about these five acts of courage. Mm -hmm. um, can you go through those and how they? Absolutely, yes. How you've used them. So I did. I did a business presentation, um, actually in January of this year, um, mm -hmm. and it was about navigating um, 2021 coming out of coming out of COVID. And I debated about whether whether to tell this story or not, and. I decided to tell the story. And another part of my story is um, three days after I had witnessed my son's arrest, I, was in, I went in to meet with an, a company that I was working with, their executive team, and found out that the CEO's son had died of an overdose the same day that my son had been arrested. And so in that moment, because it was just three days later, I was able to hold the space for them 
and help that executive team minus the CEO because she was, um, you know, navigating her own grief at that point and shock. Um, help them navigate their own grief and shock. And what do we do? This company is in a growth phase. You know, blah blah blah. So it, I realized, okay, I'm I must have some skills here. If I'm able to be from Saturday to Tuesday and not get caught up and triggered in my own stuff. Um, and so when I did this presentation, I thought, okay, what did I do mm -hmm. um, from Saturday to Tuesday? And the first thing was feel. I felt. I got back up to the hotel room and I just dropped to my knees and completely fell out um, from an emotional perspective. I just let it go. And, um, you know, my wife was there and she was amazing in terms of supporting me, but I just lost it. Mm -hmm. And I gave myself permission to feel the desperation, to feel the shattered dream, to feel a broken heart. <clears throat> And we're not, mm, our culture isn't very friendly to feeling the feelings. So that's the first act of courage is actually having the courage to feel your feelings and allow them to move through you. And, um, and so I, you know, fortunately um, I'm, I'm able to do that, but I know a lot of people who need permission. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And, and a community to support them in doing that. Yeah. Um, and then the second thing was, okay, I had, I, I had before this, I had a pretty rigorous self-care program anyway, because of the work that I do in the world. Um, but I was like, I got, I got home from that experience and went, okay, I got to up my self-care because I'm, um, I'm hurting right now. And I know the things that work for me when I'm not hurting. Now I need to start to employ some of the things that I know will help me um, ease the hurt and the pain and rise up from that hurt and pain. And so I upped my self-care. And then the second thing, which I kind of alluded to a little earlier was I got on the phone with my community because 95% of our success or failure is directly determined by who we surround ourselves with. So that was another reason to, to do the vision quest process was because that community would be, I knew would be extraordinarily pivotal and powerful and profound to hold me in this space um, that I was in right now with my son's journey. Mm -hmm. um, and then fourth is you, <laughs> I needed to have more powerful beliefs that would elevate me and continue to lean into more powerful questions that again would elevate me. And the questions that we ask ourselves de definitely lead us down a certain path. And so I was not going to be like, why is this happening? Um, I wasn't gonna go down that path. I was gonna go down the path of what I said earlier was, what are the gifts and lessons embedded in this experience for me? What is it that I'm meant to learn through this experience and this journey? What is meant to emerge in my life that will be of service to the world? Um, so identifying those kinds of questions. And then finally it was, okay, now I need information. I need to know how do I navigate the jail system? How do I navigate the drug court system? How do I navigate talking to the health person who's within the jail? How do we navigate um, relapse? Yeah, You know, what's going on with his brain? So I wanted the brain science. Um, I wanted to talk to people who were clean and sober, you know, multiple years. Like I have a really close friend um, who was a 28 year recovering meth addict. So, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm on the phone with her and I'm saying, okay, so help me understand when you're in addiction, what's going through your head? Mm-hmm. Um, and that was just so helpful. Um, so we've since, you know, got a lot of this on video in terms of interviews that these are life-changing interviews for me. So I believe that they will be life-changing interviews for other people too. So those things, those five acts feel self-care community beliefs and profound questions and vigilant learning, um, are the things that I employed. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, um, 
feelings. I, I'm just going to go through just kind of what I felt about each of these really quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, you know, even, even six years on there's, there are times where I will, um, I will eat my feelings <laughs> these days. Cause I don't drink anymore, mm -hmm. but just that, that, that moment of wanting, because I don't, nobody wants to feel bad. Right. Mm -hmm. Nobody mm -hmm. wants to feel sad or angry or hurt or frustrated. And there's plenty externally in the world right now to feel mm -hmm. sad and angry and hurt and frustrated at, let alone mm -hmm. what's going on inside my own head and my own heart. <laughs> right. <clears throat> and, you know, just learning that like, okay, well, we have to sit with this for a moment mm -hmm. and knowing some, trying to see that when you talked about seeing patterns and waves, mm -hmm. I try to look at that in my own life now. Um, that I have a little bit of clarity, not a lot, mm -hmm. but a little bit more than I used to. Sure. And so I'm like, I can sort of step outside and go, yeah, this, this feels bad right now, but it's, it's not a punishment from God. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. as much as I'd like to, and I'm dealing with some injuries too, right now, where I'm just like, is this a punishment from God? And like, <laughs> no, you just lifted that weight wrong because you didn't know what you were doing. And so this is the lesson that you have to learn, but mm -hmm. like, just that sort of like, okay, sometimes things are going to feel bad and that's fine. Mm -hmm. That's just fine. So mm -hmm. try to observe it and move mm -hmm. through it. And if that just means sitting there quietly and crying, then that's yes. fine too. Um, and two, like the self-care, especially around, dealing with somebody else who's an, who's an addict or an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. And I know people who are actively drinking. I know mm -hmm. people who I would love to be able to say things to, but I know because of my own experience, mm -hmm. there's nothing I can say. Yeah. There's nothing I can do. And so mm -hmm. for me, part of the self-care is distancing myself a little bit from people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and showing a little more discipline in like, you know, obviously we're not giving them money, but also in my language and what I say and how, mm -hmm. when things come up and I go, well, you know, I mean, that's, that, if that's what you're going to want to do, that's fine, but I'm not going mm -hmm. to do that with you. Correct. And sort yeah. of like that, the, 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 we hear a lot about setting boundaries. And I think that that really just means saying it's fine. You go ahead and do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. I'm just not going to, I'm not going to be a part of it. I'm not, yes. I don't, I'm not going to be mad that you do it. I'm not going to scold you or chide you or anything like right. that. Right. right. But right. so, and you're doing um, enough of that yourself. And, and so, so yeah. much. <laughs> yes. yes, exactly. Yes. Um, so the other pieces that I would add, there's so many mm -hmm. other pieces that I would add to that, John is, you know, are you getting regular exercise? What, how are you eating? How, are, what supplements are you taking? What things are you listening to? Mm -hmm. Um, who are you surrounding yourself with? There's so many elements to self-care. Um, right. And we're in the process of actually putting together a checklist of all mm -hmm. the areas that um, people would not necessarily identify as taking care of themselves, yeah. um, but are critically important. How much sleep are you getting a night? Are you sleeping at night? Or are you waking up in the middle of the night and you can't get back to sleep? I mean, sleep in and of itself is one of the number one issues that our culture deals with. And it is so critically important to our health and wellness. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a whole plethora of things that fall under the bucket mm -hmm. of self-care. Um, in addition to what you mentioned in terms of uh, the distancing, um, the boundaries, the getting clear, this is kind of, uh, I love you and I'm not going to participate in your disease from that perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, yeah, so I just wanted to yeah, yeah, just because I can't, I can't be of any use to you when you're ready. If I am constantly being enabled or feeling depressed, or mm -hmm. really, if I am sort of, you know, just indulging in your sadness and your mm -hmm. madness, right? And so my mm -hmm. thing is like, well, I guess I'm just going to keep doing the thing that I'm doing. And mm -hmm. um, if and when you're ready, you may never be ready, and you may die, right? early and painfully. And I can't, I understand and accepting that I can't do any more than what I'm doing, except mm -hmm. be ready to talk when you're ready or be ready to listen when you're ready to talk. Yes. And so <laughs> I think that's a really um, great point because we need to be available in a healthy way when, and if the one that we love decides to get help. 
And, um, and just recently, uh, you know, my wife and I had the conversation, okay, what are we going to do if he, if Sam dies and how will we navigate that? And, um, as, as difficult as that conversation was, it was really important to have it. Um, and, and we know this is a deadly disease. I mean, this, the stats are off the charts, particularly with the pandemic. Um, and it's a possibility. Now, do I give it a lot of energy? No. Um, I, every morning, rise to um, pictures of Sam, light and bright and beautiful. And that's how I hold him um, the majority of the day. So there's a, there's a big difference there. Yeah, yeah. And finding a community. And you also said storytelling. Mm -hmm. And I think that that can be, that can sound like a very big and sort of fantastical word, storytelling. But mm -hmm. what it comes down to is me just finding somebody else that I relate to. Yes. And that when they share with me, I go, oh yeah, that sounds like me. And then I, sh I share something with them and mm -hmm. they're like, yep, I know exactly what you're going through, buddy, because I was there, whether it was a year or five or 10 or 15 years ago. Right. And I think that that for me has been the, one of the core things of getting sober was, mm -hmm. oh, I like what that person says. I'm going to yes. go talk to them. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was one thing that for me, the program gave me was an ability mm -hmm. to a chance, an opportunity to meet people and go, yeah, you know what? That person, <clears throat> that's great that they have. X amount of years sober, they're not the kind of person I want to hang out with. And mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with that. They're just, no. we're not going to get along with every single person we meet. Right. right? We're exactly. Not, we're, not, we're not wired that way, but yeah, um, exactly. Finding a proper community with proper connections that are just going to help me mm -hmm. in my daily life. Absolutely. Super helpful. Yes. Well, and, um, you know, one of the things I am almost obsessive about is that we have a safe community. Mm -hmm. And I recently did an interview with a mom of an addict who has since passed away and the daughter-in-law. Um, and they both said, uh, we never get an opportunity to tell our story. And because I'm so steeped in talking to so many different people that had not registered for me. And I thought, oh, wow, how extraordinary is that? that this is the first time that they're actually really telling their story was with me. Mm -hmm. um, and we, uh, obviously it was on camera and um, how brave of them to do that. Um, and I wanna talk to them again. I wanna have a second conversation with them. <clears throat> um, but now I realize that there are more and more people who are the loved ones who are kind of in the background, who haven't had the opportunity or have chosen not to come out from the shadows to actually tell their, their story, their side of the, the street um, and how powerful that really, really is. Yeah, I mean, in active alcoholism, it was all about me. I was selfish. I needed the spotlight on me. I needed the drama to be about me. I needed every single person in my life, family, friends, et cetera, to be supporting this addiction of mine. Mm -hmm. And if they weren't, then there was a problem and everybody was going to hear about it. And I didn't care what anybody else had to say. Mm -hmm. Your hurt, your pain, you don't understand. Mine's a lot worse, right? Mm -hmm. yes. And so this was my <laughs> way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then to go, oh, wait a second, <clears throat> perhaps my, my mother is a real human being outside of being my mother. And there might have been some things I, I overlooked during that time. <laughs> to say there the might least. have been. <laughs> so yes. um, that's something yeah. that has really, um, that, that, that has occurred to me. I was like, oh yeah. And so when you talk about giving people a, a chance to share how they feel when they have been ignored and overlooked and used by the people in their lives that are in active alcoholism and addiction. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that that's really important as well. Absolutely. Well, and you know, what I found to be true too, John, is that all the acts that I just talked about and mm -hmm. the things that we're talking about, these are all the things that 
the recovering community gets as a part of recovering. Mm -hmm. There is no generally a recovering community for the loved ones um, that is as robust. Right. And so um, I was left with like, okay, okay, where do I go? Um, And without finding a community through Al-Anon that worked for me, I was Mm -hmm. left with, okay, we'll create one. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so I, I was thinking earlier, um, I was talking to some friends of mine, uh, alcoholic recovery, a drug addiction recovery, and we were talking about the books that we were reading. And I said, and it suddenly dawned on me, my library is their library mm-hmm. and vice versa, because this is just really all about getting back to our own humanity on both sides of the street. Yeah. Um, it, it, the doors look different. Yeah. 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 It's, um, it's, it makes all the difference in the world to have somebody to talk to (laughs) and somebody to listen to you, you know, and to to have those resources. And uh, so many times somebody has said, Hey, have you tried this book? And I've had people who were, um, staunch old school, like 40 plus years, Mm -hmm. AA people suggest a book that was sort of outside of that. And I was like, oh, that surprised me. I didn't expect (laughs) that from you. Like, Mm -hmm. well, that sounds fascinating. Um, Okay. And that it is, it is very easy to, it's very easy for me to be dismissive and judgmental. Like that's something that I have been for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And um, I have found that it's been a lot more helpful for me to say, to take a step back from those moments of Mm -hmm. judgment and go, well, wait a second, maybe this person does have something to say. Maybe, maybe they have a resource that I don't have, regardless Mm -hmm. of how I perceive them immediately. Mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and that's been super helpful too. Um, the fourth one was beliefs and finding mm-hmm. a belief system that works. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm gonna, I have this, this analogy that kind of came up just, just, just now while we were talking, mm-hmm. when you talk about trying to help somebody who's, who's an alcoholic, who's an addict, right? So mm-hmm. I'm from Las Vegas, Nevada, and, um, I know a little bit about playing cards <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> and not a lot, but a little bit. Yeah. And when you're playing blackjack, if you follow certain rules at the table, mm-hmm. um, like you don't, you know, hit on 17 and you just sort of stay the course and you do the things, you can actually win a little bit of money. You can mm-hmm. do pretty good for yourself if you just stick within the odds. The mm-hmm. problem is what happens is we get greedy or we get excited or we think if we can just Mm -hmm. take this chance, we -hmm. can make, we can make a lot of money, right? Mm -hmm. We can, Mm -hmm. you know what, we just need to be, we just need to bet big and go and help and do everything that we can for this other person. Mm -hmm. And then we end up losing everything because we blew it because we made the wrong choice because we didn't Mm -hmm. know what, what cards were in that six decks of cards that the person was holding. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it just occurred to me that creating a belief system that for me goes, you know what? I don't, I don't help unless somebody wants help. Right. I don't, I don't go out of my way because ultimately what it does is I just end up, you know, losing all my chips. And I know this is not the best analogy, but it's kind of like (laughs) one that just popped in my head was like, it's important to kind of have those beliefs about not only what I can do to help others, but also, Mm -hmm it's important for me because I can't spend all my time worrying Mm -hmm. about somebody else, you know? Mm -hmm. And then there's the whole higher power thing. And and that's, Mm -hmm. that's a whole personal, Mm -hmm. you know, project that we all have to undertake Mm -hmm. regardless of how you feel about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, coming to a set of core beliefs about just how I operate in the world and operate with other addicts um, and just being patient and minding my own business until somebody says, Hey, John, can you help me? Yes. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. And I mean, I, (laughs) I think hmm, this is a generalization, but women in particular, um, are wired to take care of things Mm -hmm. and men are wired to fix it. 
Um, and so um, that wiring, uh, you're, you're making assumptions there that other people want to be fixed and other people want to be helped. And it took me a long time to learn that I needed permission um, it, it, before I advanced. Um, and permission to um, be present with somebody is a sacred trust. And you are not just granted permission. Yeah. So, <clears throat> and, and you know, and I, through this whole experience is one of the major things is, you know, having the belief that it's okay to ask for help. That one belief alone is, yeah. you know, pivotal for um, uh, all of us. <clears throat> and we are not trained to ask for help. It's thought of as being weak and, um, you know, this whole rugged individualism and um, blah, 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 which is just a bunch of bull. Um, so learning to ask for help. And on the other side of that is also learning to receive help. Mm -hmm. Cause they're two completely different things. And, um, so that one belief yeah. <clears throat> will change everything. Yeah. I mean, I had something recently in November, I had a, uh, a friend I know from out of state and, uh, say, Hey, I need to get, I need to be, you know, um, accountable with somebody. We were talking about like working out and, um, just, taking, you know, doing some sort of workout challenge between the two of us. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I don't really feel like putting something on social media, but like, I feel like any, the thing that he said was, I feel like I need to have a good month or I'm going to have a really bad month. Now, I don't think that this person was in any jeopardy of relapse. And we were just talking about, I don't know, doing push-ups and sit-ups or something. <laughs> sure. But I had not expected this person to ask me for this. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, wow, okay, even people that maybe I perceive as strong and or doing mm -hmm. well or or taking care of themselves, you go like, I need to ask for help. Mm -hmm. And it's fine. And I was immediately like, well, yeah, what do you want to do? Because mm -hmm. wait a second, I need this too. Mm -hmm. I wish I would have thought to ask somebody for this. <laughs> I didn't know. Right. Right. <clears throat> so it was, it became apparent that it was not only something that they needed, it was something that I needed as well. And right. um, it just, it struck me again, somebody I didn't think was going to ask for help, asked me for help mm -hmm. and um, how important it is to say, Hey, I need help. Yes. And then to be, well, like you said, the next step is to be a little more receptive to learning, mm -hmm. right. To, to, to receive, to receive. Yeah. And that's, that can be a challenging thing for everybody involved too. When I have been so, I mean, I was closed off and guarded and it took me months before I talked to anybody. I would just, mm -hmm. I would sit in my bedroom and not drink thinking that I was going to fix myself somehow. And mm -hmm. I was just driving myself crazy, but mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it's, it's huge. It's huge. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Got to ask for help. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to, but if you want, if you want help, <laughs> there are people well, who I mean, you. we're wired to be communal. Mm -hmm. And that's not the messaging that we've been given, you know, and um, so if we can, you know, part of my thing is if we can, if we can mm, model and embrace asking for help ourselves, I mean, cause I think, you know, generally speaking, most people think I'm really strong and I've got it together and, you know, so on and so forth. And then I routinely ask for help. And it's kind of like, you know, what you just experienced was, oh, didn't expect that. Mm -hmm. um, but part of it is number one, I need help, but I also want to model um, how important it is to ask for help when you really do need it. And then to accept it in a way that um, is gracious and appreciative and action oriented. Um, so I don't want to ask for help and then do nothing with it. Right. Um, because, you know, that's just not how I roll, but, um, uh, so I, uh, you know, just kind of highlighting that number one, we need to learn the ability to ask for help and be okay with it and not judge ourselves because of it. Um, and then learning to actually receive and cause when you're in that receiving place, wow, that's really powerful too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It feels good. 
Mm -hmm. You're like, wait a second, who is this stranger? And why do they want to help me? I mean, my first thought is mistrust, right? Because I've been, but little by little, I'm like, oh, okay. This person doesn't really want anything from me. Right. And then ultimately I'm like, oh, okay. They're, they're here to help because it's helping them too. Mm -hmm. Like this is, this goes both ways. So, Mm -hmm. so maybe I should just shut up and do my part. (laughs) (laughs) Is what I, that, that that was, you know, what I said to myself, I was like, oh, okay. So just be a part of this. Don't worry about, don't stop trying to control exactly how it goes or how it's supposed to be. Yeah. Um, the, the, the last of the, the acts of courage. And I think that I'm, is the um, vigilant learning. And so Mm -hmm. in that and, and creating voices in courage, Mm -hmm. um, what are some of those resources that are available um, there for people? Well, first off um, I, we created a book list, (laughs) Okay, you know, of all these different books from a variety of different sources that I pretty much kind of had to cobble together myself. Um, And, um, uh, videos. Um, I mean, I know one of the rehabs that Sam was in, I went to the front <clears> desk <throat> and I said, okay, what do you recommend in mm-hmm. terms of reading and documentaries or videos or whatever that was? And um, uh, Pleasure Unwoven was one of the videos that they recommended. That one video was life-changing for me. Um, and so, so we have that list. Um, then we have the group coaching, which is is not just, it's about helping people move from crisis to struggling, to surviving, to thriving. So there's a very clear path towards even the notion that I can thrive in the midst of this chaos and desperation and all that goes with the disease for a lot of people is like, are you kidding me? So we're, we're creating the platform to actually have that conversation. And how do you progress through? Um, and even in the moments when, um, you know, we Sam just re- re- relapsed in the last couple months. Okay, so here we go again. We're we're kind of in this crisis moment again, but our skills are much better to be able to move through crisis, struggling, surviving, and, and thriving in a faster period of time because of what I've learned and what we coach and train. Um, then we have. Um, online coaching, Mm -hmm. um, online training, which we do the five acts of courage as an online training component. And there's two other um, training components we're working on right now. Um, And then um, I think those, and then then the interviews, I I think all of that helps people figure out where they want to enter this community, where they feel safe first. They can be in the shadows and watch a ton of interviews and see themselves and ideas and thoughts hopefully differently than how they're, they're centered in that moment Mm -hmm. as ideas to how to move in the, in their own journey. Um, And then if they're bolder, they can go on the group coaching calls. Those are always recorded. Um, They can just be actually on a call Mm -hmm. where there are other people on a call, or they can just watch the video. Right. Um, And Um, And so those things, whether it's three o'clock in the morning or whether it's, you know, seven o'clock at night or it's, you know, whatever time of day, wherever you are in the world, you have access to all these resources. And we've not found any place else that has that many resources available any time of day. Right. Yeah. One of the other things I heard you say from a previous interview, too, was the you talk about dancing in dysfunction, I think was the phrase that you used and yeah. how <clears throat> as somebody who is living with an alcoholic or an addict, you've learned to do this dance with them in their active alcoholism, <clears throat> excuse me. And then you have to now what relearn mm-hmm. how to deal with them and their, their sensitive, you know, raw nerve nonsense and they're feeling everything all the time. And now they're mm-hmm. even more needy in another way, you know, I'm mm-hmm. speaking about myself, mm-hmm. um, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and so that's a huge shift because you could have oh. spent, I don't know, most of your life walking around somebody in active, you know, addiction, and then have to learn 
And it's, and it, even if they're, even if it's the best of outcomes and they take to it right away and they're just like so full of life and rosiness and ready to help. And you're like, well, who is this person? Right. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, this is the one, this is one of the conversations that has been really up a lot is okay they go to rehab they come they come out of rehab sometimes they go to residential treatment potentially you know a group home or something sober home or whatever that is okay so who am i dancing with now i i know that i know the addict dance um and i'm getting better at my side of the dance mm -hmm. um and <clears throat> then how do I do this dance with somebody who's clean and sober, their head's getting straight, they're learning all these different things. If I'm not learning to dance differently, then I'm not going to be of support and help to them. Right. And so, so it's that dance, not only of there's the dance of dysfunction, but the, then there's also the dance of health and healing. Mm -hmm. And we both have different parts in that dance. Yeah. And just for yourself too, right? Because mm -hmm. at that point, mm -hmm. I would want to grow along with that person mm -hmm. for myself. Mm -hmm. If I'm, you know, assuming that I'm going, if this, especially if this is a family member, because, you know, that, yes. that relationship is kind of there, not always, but often regardless, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's not mm -hmm. really, I mean, I've had people that I don't speak to anymore because of, we just have different behavioral patterns, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not interested in going to the bar on Saturday night anymore, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but family's a little bit different. And so just finding a way to be better yourself, because now, hopefully, mm -hmm. if they're in some sort of program of recovery, there ought to be some unburdening on your mm -hmm. part, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. so you would want, like you said, to thrive, not just not mm -hmm. just survive or walk around on eggshells or be dealing with somebody Mm -hmm. who's drunk all the time. So mm -hmm. I think that that is a, a hugely, I mean, important thing to remember that it's also about you. Yes. Well, I mean, me you anymore. know, you know, the drill, <laughs> it's like, take my alcoholic or take my addict and fix them, but I'm not going to do any work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then you, you give them back to us um, and we'll just drive on. Right. And wow, that is just so not how it rolls. Yeah. Um, you know, and so we have our own work to do in this. And yeah. um, and so I one of the beliefs I do have is that there that actually there is a gift embedded in this disease. And um, and I do think it is a disease that is raising a red flag for society to say how we're operating is not working yeah and we need to figure out a way to honor our humanity and be kind to each other and drop the judgment and and really love each other more unconditionally and <clears throat> yeah and that doesn't always mean being available or mm -hmm. kind or any of those things that I think feel intrinsic, especially, you know, as a parent, I imagine I'm not one myself, but, mm -hmm. you know, having to almost go against those instincts, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. it's no longer, that's no longer, I'm no longer your son. I'm an, I'm an addict. Right. Right. <laughs> and so, right having to try and explain that, you know, I, I can't when in the midst of it, but you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's very difficult, but it's Im important. <laughs> yeah. I, one of the things that, you know, I still struggle with is how do I help? Um, how do I show up in a way that will serve and um, Sam during his journey in, in addiction <laughs> right now? And um, it's hard for me sometimes when he calls and the story is I'm living in my car. I've run out of all resources. I don't have any money. I I'm hungry, um, which was the call the other day. And, and then to say, no, we're not giving you any money. Yeah. Um, and, 
to hold the line on that. And quite frankly, I needed my wife to be able to make that decision and stand strong in it. Yeah. And, um, and then um, I cried um, because as a mom, you want to be able to do something. Um, and I needed to reorient my thinking to understand that doing something was saying no. Yeah, that's, that's huge. And that's, you were doing something, you mm -hmm. were doing the best thing that you could, regardless mm -hmm. of how it made you feel in the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, and, you know, I'll, I'll say one thing, uh, as, as an alcoholic and a, sometimes I was a sometimes drug user. It wasn't my main thing, but I was happy to take whatever came in front of me. Mm -hmm. um, and plenty of, I've been in plenty of situations I've never told my mother about. <laughs> um, but the, yeah, sure. <clears throat> the thing that I have come to understand now, six years on, and even then, I was always able to take care of myself. Certainly my standard of living was extremely low at certain mm -hmm. points, mm -hmm. but I was always able to take care of myself. I was mm -hmm. always able to find a way through. I was always able to find, I mean, if I could find alcohol and drugs, I could find a way, I would find a place to sleep and I'd find mm -hmm. something to eat at some point, you know? And mm -hmm. so I, and the thing that I keep reminding, I have to remind myself is that I haven't let myself down. Or if I have, I've always been able to pick myself up mm -hmm. and um, that we, it takes a lot of strength and determination to be an addict and an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you yes. have to really, really <laughs> want it. You know, you have to work for it and it requires a lot of planning. It requires a lot of plotting and strategizing, mm -hmm. um, daily maintenance. Like there, there's a lot mm -hmm. that goes into it mm -hmm. and alcoholics I found are some of the strongest, mm -hmm. smartest, mm -hmm. um, well, prepared people mm -hmm. <laughs> um super resourceful resourceful thank you that's the word that i wanted to use mm -hmm. so yep um anybody who's listening who has somebody in their life who's mm -hmm. who's going through this mm -hmm. i guarantee you mm -hmm. they're not as bad off as they would want you to think mm -hmm. <laughs> you know yes. and i mean everybody's different but i know that i wasn't every time mm -hmm. i asked for help yeah yeah you know? that resourcefulness i every story that i've heard on uh, that substance abuse side of the equation is they are massively resourceful um, and they're super smart. Um, and, um, and I learned this from uh, the friend that I alluded to earlier, um, recovering from meth addiction. What she said to me was when he reaches out to you to get money and you say, no, he's like next. Yeah. And he said, it's a transaction. Yeah. It's not a relationship. You happen to be his mom, but in that moment, it, all it is, as far as he's concerned, is a transaction. And if you don't give him the money, he, he just goes, okay, next. Yeah. Um, now he may be mad. He may say, you know, something, um, but trust me, it's a transaction. Yeah. And that window in was so valuable to me yeah. to be able to frame it that way. You don't have to take any, you don't have to hold any guilt. It's just a transaction, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. it, it alleviates you of all the guilt mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that you can function and go mm -hmm. on with your day. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, that's great. That's, that's a great, that's a great epiphany to be mm -hmm. able to, to, to know that mm -hmm. um, it doesn't always make it as easy, you know, but still it's, it's, it's important. Um, so, and I don't want to take up too much more of your time. But um, where can people find this? And mm -hmm. um, do you have any parting words for people dealing, struggling, looking to th survive and thrive? First, I think first and foremost is ask for help, ask for help, ask for help. Keep looking for the help that you need. Because some of the help that, like some of the books that I read, some of the help that I got, um, I only wanted a slice of that and the rest of it I let go. And it doesn't mean that the first book that you read is the gospel um, mm -hmm. and the ab absolute way. Pay attention to what resonates with you and, and dump the rest. Right. Um, so please, please, please ask for help because 
we are in a pandemic of addiction at this point. I don't, there's very few people that I talk to that don't know somebody or they don't have their own story. So we have to get over our shame and our judgment and the moral pieces to this and just ask for help. Um, and, this, and then the final piece is, that's why we created Voices in Courage, was to be able to create a safe community for people to get help, to get answers, to understand this disease, to have people that they can talk to, um, books and resources and coaching and all of those things. So just go to voicesincourage.com and you can, you know, if you give us your email addresses, um, we will send you information. We'll send you the five acts of courage right off the bat. And that's a 23 page PDF that goes through the five acts that we just talked about. Um, and begin to get to know our community. Um, and if you are so inclined and you need a more robust community, then the membership is available too. And um, uh, that window towards the membership is on voicesencouraged.com also. Kale, thank you so much. This was really nice to talk with you. And um, I appreciate your time and what you're doing for a whole other swath of people that we alcoholics, we addicts don't often think about when we have these conversations. So thank yeah. you. Well, thank you, John. I so appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and visit with you and, and um, give the another side yeah. to this story. The other, the other <clears throat> dancing partner is uh, the yes. moms, the dads, the aunts, the uncles, the friends, the wives, um, you know, all of it. And yeah. there's more of us than you. <laughs> this much is true. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes. Thank so you. thank you so much and happy holidays. Yes. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks again for listening. Our music as always is by Neglect. You can find more of his stuff at neglect.bandcamp.com. And you can find us on all social media platforms that matter. Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And you can reach us at a is for alcoholic at gmail.com. Talk to you later. Yeah. <laughs>